Let's read Genesis 2. Let's start with, just, let's read it. If you're new, uh, we're doing the book of Genesis. I'm hoping to get through Genesis 11 by Memorial Day or somewhere in there. We'll take a break and then come back next fall and tackle Abraham. And I don't know what speed we'll go, but I sort of don't care. I think the point is, let's just... Let's just sort of go through it. But I'm not going to go into the level of detail that uh, we could. I'm trying to take a, not a 35,000 foot view, but maybe a 12,000 foot view. I don't know. Uh, but last week we talked about Genesis 1, where the universe was created, and really the cosmos out of chaos was created as a place for the pinnacle of creation, which was man, mankind, male and female. It sounds pretty arrogant when you just say it this way, but God, the Bible actually does say God created the world for our enjoyment. He created it for us. Let's start at verse 4. These are the generations of... And if you remember two weeks ago when I introduced Genesis as a whole, this is a phrase that recurs about a dozen times in the, book, in the 50 chapters. These are the generations of Abraham, or of Isaac, or of Joseph. Uh, and here, the generations of the heavens and the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When there was no bush of the field, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but that's pretty significant when we come to the story of a fellow named Noah, and it rained. And apparently, until the flood, there wasn't rain. There was a mist that went up. Uh, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain out of the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist, and there's some different translations who will not pause on, but was going up from the land and watering the whole face of the ground. But it relates to this whole concept of waters above the earth and the firmament. And apparently in the flood, God released waters above the earth. I'm not just talking about evaporation and condensation. I'm talking about waters above the earth. And God opened the windows of heaven and, and the flood came. Visit the ark in Kentucky. They talk about this stuff a lot. And it's very interesting. Even if you disagree with some of their conclusions, it's very interesting what they're talking about and worth reflection. Okay, uh, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed, and that's the same word used for what a potter does when a potter forms clay. And this potter is not using clay. It says he's using dust, which is interesting, but he's using dirt. I like that thought. The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. <clears throat> God didn't do anything remotely similar to that, to the monkeys or the dogs or the penguin, but when he created a human person, he used his own hands, he shaped just what he wanted. He uses a different word for when he gets to Eve. I'll go ahead and tell you, it says he built Eve. It's a different word than form. That's a very interesting word to me. He, bi he built her. I, uh, I just sort of let my mind go crazy with that. Um, and with the man, it's like Michelangelo or could make a statue or could carve a carving, but it was just a dead piece of stone. But God took the shape of the cadaver that he had made and breathed into it. And again, that's unique 
in all the created order. Verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, not the garden of Eden, but the garden in Eden. Interesting thought. Apparently, there was a world outside the garden that we know nothing about. <laughs> but I'm dying to say, what's out there? And uh, this may help answer the question, where did Cain get his wife? And those kind of questions, I don't know. But the garden is not synonymous with Eden. The garden is in Eden. Okay. In the east, and there he put the man he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food. Trees that are nice to look at and they're nice to eat. Pleasing to the eye, pleasing to the taste. The word Eden means delight, means pleasure. It's a sensuous kind of place. God loves the five senses. And when they're sanctified and used like he wants them, it's a very sensual reality. His crea in joy. When, um, okay. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. One of the commentaries I read this week said, isn't it interesting that there's no gold in Eden? There's gold in Havilah, and I think it's good. It's part of the created order. But in Eden, there's no gold. I just, I don't know what to do with that. I just think that's significant. And really, no one knows anything about Pishon or Havilah. There's a lot of ink invested in this, but basically, nobody knows. And the gold of that land is good. Bedlam, onyx, and stones are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon, it is the one that flowed around the land of Cush. Now we know virtually nothing about Gihon, but we do know something about Cush. Where is Cush? <coughs> Ethiopia. So there's a fair number of people who think the Gihon may have been the Nile. Pretty significant, if that's true. Uh, flowing either into or out of Egypt. But and the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. We know those rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. You can chart them on a map. Uh, what the flood did with these rivers is an interesting question, and uh, I'll talk about it in a minute. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, there, to do what? Work. Don't be too quick to say work is a result of sin. Sin made work into toil and labor and sweat, but God worked for six days creating the universe, and He made us in His image. Work is a good thing. Okay, I'm going to come back. Okay, to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may eat of every tree in the garden. Go for it. But, sort of like when your parents told you you can play hide and seek and hide in any place of the house except that closet. <laughs> what is a child thinking? What's in that closet? I want to I go look in the, the, the very command has the potential, maybe even in a sinless world, to incite a, a desire. The psychology of this is deeper than I am, uh, which is not saying that much. 
Sorry, I laugh at my own jokes. You don't have to. Um, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. In the day you eat of it, you'll die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good. Now, if you were here last week, I think seven times we read it was good, 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 it was very good. But there's one thing in a perfect environment where there is no sin that is not good. That is an amazing statement. That's just amazing. It doesn't call it evil. It doesn't say it's wicked. It's just the abs there's something that's got the absence of good attached to it, <laughs> if, I know, if I understand it. And that is that Adam is alone. The man is alone, so I will make a helper fit. We're going to come back and talk about those two words. A helper who is suitable appropriate for Adam. Um, now, so God's going to start looking for this helper fit for Adam. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. In chapter 1, God gave things names, and God called the light day, and God called the heaven firmament. I forget what it was. Now, Adam, in his image, has an assignment to name the animals. This is pretty amazing. Okay. Um, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. I sort of picture it. God brings the penguin and said... You know, what do you think? Pretty cute, don't you think, Adam? I mean, yeah, it's cute. I'll call him a penguin, but I don't think that's right for me. And God said, okay, let's try another one. But one after another, where's a helper fit for Adam? Powerful story. In all the universe, they couldn't find one. So, the Lord God caused a deep sleep. Some of the most important things God does in Scripture are while we're sleeping. Gethsemane. Uh, Pascal loved to say in his writings, he, in Gethsemane, God saved them while they slept. He came and found them sleeping. He's over there praying, let this cut path. The disciples are sleeping. God's saving them. Okay. So Adam, take a nap. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he built. There's the word built. And if you get my Bible, it has a footnote. But it's a different word than what he did for the heavens and the earth and what he did for Adam. When it came to woman, God built her. And I just think he, I used to tell people in my pre-marriage classes, God thought up every curve in a woman's body. He designed it. You know, and the, it's just, it, the men right now are really smiling. It's like God did that. He built woman. And she's the pinnacle of creation. She's the very last thing God creates. He's been so, uh, and brought her to the man. And this is the first human speech, and it's poetry. Because when man laid his eyes on woman, suddenly he becomes a poet. <laughs> it's, and it's, it's true. We get this. This is, this is true. <laughs> this at last, and that phrase at last, I think means this is what I've been looking for all my life. And, of course, all of Adam's life. I think Augustine said was only about six hours at this point. <laughs> we don't know exactly, but he'd been naming animals. He'd been, it, 
probably is, we shouldn't think in terms of a l literal day here. I don't, I'm just working with the text. But he said, this is what I'm made for. This, and he just becomes a poet. Man, somebody said, he said, whoa, man. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> va, va, boom. Yeah, that's the, that's the point. Uh, she shall be called woman, and he gives her a name. And again, headship in the home is a very interesting question here. And there, man, you can go to seminary and debate this. Um, yeah, what's that? He didn't give her the name for actual call. He said, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Okay, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave and cleave. That's the King James, which I just don't think you can improve on. And those two words have so much psychological wisdom in them. No marriage can survive unless there's a leaving and a cleaving. It's just, it's, and it's boom, right, right here on day six of creation. A man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and Two shall be what? Yeah, one plus one equals, careful, it might equal three, <laughs> but it doesn't equal two. It might equal one. One plus one equals one. One plus one equals three. When Adam knew his wife, she conceived. Intimacy brings fertility. That's, and that comes out of the image of God, where one plus one plus one equals one. I think <laughs> biblical math is interesting. It'll uh, yeah, you're the you're our math professor right here in the front row. Uh, and they shall be one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Nothing to hide. That changes dramatically in Genesis 3. So we'll come back next week. All right. Let's talk a little bit. Um, my purpose tonight is to make you unhappy. Aren't you glad you came? To make you aware of the fact, and me, that deep inside there is a longing, a holy discontent with the way things are. I really think a long time on how to introduce a subject, because with a subject like Genesis 2, you could, you could tackle this from so many different angles. But um, years ago I got interested in C.S. Lewis and the way he talks about longing. It's a, it's a major theme that deep inside, and Lewis can get very personal talking about, he says, sometimes music will elicit it. L let, me, let me just stay on my notes. But so tonight, if we get to the benediction and you have a holy discontent with the way things are, and I don't mean because you're living in sin. I hope you're not. I mean because you're living the way you ought to, but the way things ought to be. Why did my friends die this week? It's not supposed to be that way. And, and we all know that. But what do you do with it? And where do, where do you take it? Well, I think that's why we have Genesis 2. There are moments in life when we suddenly become aware of this inner ache. It may be awakened by a song or an aroma, honeysuckle on, on, on a summer evening. Oh my goodness, that does things to me. Um, a movie, a certain place, or by something that just takes your breath away with beauty. The second movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony makes me gasp every time I hear it and will often make me cry. And I say, why? Uh, let me, I tried to think 
of the things that in me, this is personal, because we're different here. I ran this by Katie and Anna about an hour ago. I said, you know, what awakens the longing? Katie immediately said, beauty. And I said, give me an example. And she finally said, the Alps. Just sort of, and suddenly you're aware things aren't what they ought to be. There's, there's an ache of, that's sort of indefinable. Uh, Saturday night, we had the TV on, and it was on KET TV, educational, and of all things, um, it was Alan Jackson singing at the Grand Ole Opry. Did you see this? Alan Jackson's country as can be, but a big cowboy hat at the Grand Ole Opry, I don't know, five years ago, whatever it was on, but he was singing gospel. And his opening song was uh, Blessed Assurance. And it just, I, tears came by. I was just like, that is, it just grabs something inside of me that is there, but I don't know it's there until something elicits it. Then maybe two nights ago, this is just me. If, if you were up here, you could tell your story. What are the things that make you cry? But we were watching the movie, Saving Mr. Banks. I, it, it is a good movie. But when um, P.L. Travers, the author of Mary Poppins, is talking to Walt Disney, Tom Hanks, you know, about making her book into a movie, <coughs> Walt Disney says something about, well, when Mary Poppins comes, she saves the children. And she says... Who said anything about saving the children? Mary Poppins did not come to save the children, and she just left it. But it was so powerful to me. It's about saving Mr. Banks, the children's father. It's got this whole storyline of her own troubled father. And, uh, but it's like, I've never thought of Mary Poppins as saving Mr. Banks. And when he goes fly a kite, you know, everybody's weeping because Mr. Banks has been saved. It's like, but wh why do we cry? Why does that move us? Well, I think C.S. Lewis would say because there's, we, we're longing for Eden. There's something not right, and, and we've touched it. When I, this was so surprising to me. On our 25th anniversary, Katie and I went to the Grand Canyon. And, you know, I, if you've been there, you sort of, you really don't see it until you, boom. <coughs> It's there, at least the, the, where we went from the parking lot. And, but I, we walked out on this patio, and then, but I just, I, I, I think if I'd have done what I should have, I should have just fallen on my face and wept. It was like I was totally unprepared for the, the beauty. And it's like, well, what, what's going on in, in this? Um, when I saw Hank Aaron hit a home run, as a teenager, I wept. <laughs> and I was, I said, where did that come from? And it's like, men get this. Men get that. But that's, that's, that's powerful. Um, anyway. So, tonight, I want you to get in touch with the longing, because the longing and that holy discontent, the things that touch you. And they won't be the things that touch me. They'll be unique. But it's Eden. It's the garden. It's the way things ought to be. And we know it, and we stifle that most of the time. It's too, it's too painful to acknowledge. I can't bear life when I have to actually say even the best things in life, your children, your marriage, you know, they're, they're not what they ought to be. That I've, I've got some nods in the room on that. That's, it's sort of hard to say that. Okay, here's some quotes. We've got to get back to Genesis, um, but I, I just, this is C.S. Lewis, number one. I just said a number of great authors write about the longing. Um, this is from The Weight of Glory. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. In other words, if you think, well, if I could just go hear Alan Jackson in person, then it would, 
it would be all the better. I can promise you if, that, if I did, I would be disappointed. And C.S. Lewis says, no, you're supposed to be. Because the, what you're longing for is not Alan Jackson singing Blessed Assurance. It's awakening something else that was triggered by that. That's so astute. Um, it is not in them, it comes through them. And what came through was longing. For they are not the thing itself. And this is one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found. The echo of a tune we have not heard. And news from a country we've never visited. That is profoundly beautiful. And so Beethoven's Ninth Symphony just awakens that. It's not the symphony. It's something, it's Eden. It's home. Here at Malcolm Muggeridge, I, um, the only disaster that can befall us, the only disaster that can befall us is to feel ourselves to be at home here on earth. As long as we are aliens, we cannot forget our true homeland. That's, that's a good quote. I'm just sharing with you some of my favorite quotes. Okay, here's Pascal from Pensee. Solomon and Job, remember Solomon had everything. Job lost everything. Solomon and Job have known and spoken best about man's wretchedness. One the happiest, the other the unhappiest of men. One knowing by experience the vanity of pleasure, and the other the reality of afflictions. Or what about Lord of the Rings? During his long journey in the Lord of the Rings, Frodo is homesick for the Shire. And if you, but the Shire is this picture of home. It's, you know, when it's South Georgia. It's when you... When you are driving south and the dirt turns red and you start seeing kudzu and signs, <laughs> signs for boiled peanuts, it's like, yeah, this is, well, that's the Shire. And while Frodo's traveling, all he wants to do is go home. He said, I just want to go home. And when I read the book, but I was totally unprepared for the ending. What I'm about to tell you comes from like the third paragraph from the end. This is like the last page of the three volumes. A thou, this is, comes from page 1007, if, you're, if you follow my notes. But when he finally gets home, back to the Shire, he has changed so much that the Shire no longer satisfies his longing. Sam is happy, but Frodo says, this is not home anymore. He... Uh, in the final scene of the trilogy, Frodo boards a ship and sails away toward the west, quote, until at last, on a night of rain, Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance on the air and heard the sound of singing that came over the water, and then it seemed he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. So there's more. There's, it's like, okay. Five comes from Ecclesiastes, just this simple phrase, God has put eternity in our hearts. What does that mean? Well, I think it means he's put something so big in your heart. You're a human person in the image of God, and he's put something in you that's so big that nothing in this world can satisfy it. That's good. <laughs> That's really good. It aches, but it's a good ache. Okay. Um, C. Genesis explains why this inner longing exists. Paradise is lost. John Milton wrote the book Paradise Lost, and that's just a great, great title for a great book. When Adam and Eve were expelled from their home in the garden, their descendants were destined to live their earthly lives east of Eden and the blank 
is homesick. We're homesick. I, uh, I get real excited about preaching about homesickness to postmoderns. Because when I preach about guilt to postmoderns, most of them say, I don't feel guilty. You know, but if I say, well, do you ever feel homesick? It's like, yeah, what are you talking about? Say, well, let's talk about homesickness. Why do you feel that way? Why can you be in the midst of a party with all your friends and suddenly have this awareness? I, this isn't home, and I'm not even sure these are my people. Who are my people? Where's my home? It's like, that's good. You're supposed to ask those questions because you're, you're not home. D, our study tonight explores what we've lost. Even when we are unconscious, and there may be somebody tonight who says, I didn't know I'd lost that until Stan told me. <laughs> anyway, the Bible begins by reminding us of a moment in time when life was everything it ought to be. And we've really only got one chapter. It's Genesis 2, but it paints a picture of this is life like it ought to be. Only when we know what we've lost is there hope that we can find what we most desperately need. I, I, this is a sermon that I want to learn how to preach, and I'm, I'm working on it. So, what we're going to do, and I think we're on good time here, our discontent is explained in four questions. Though Adam and Eve are historical figures, their story is meant to be seen part of everyone's story. Adam, you know, is the Hebrew word for man, and Eve sounds like the Hebrew word for life giver. So Adam and Eve are not just historical people in a geographical place. They are intended to help us better understand our own stories and our own inner homesickness. Because it's thanks to these great, 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 great grandparents of ours <laughs> that we're as messed up as we are and that we're, we have this longing. Okay, so there's four questions that I think Genesis 4, 2 answers that account for the ache and the longing we feel. But let, let me introduce you to the four. A, the who am I question. This is the question of identity. Big one. Life is going to be really, really hard for the person who can't figure out the answer to the question, who am I? And let me tell you, it, that was one question where it had one sort of character quality when I was 16. But at age 64, I find myself some saying, you know, who am I? And, okay, the question of identity. Letter B is on the next page. Where do I belong? This is the question of home. And where do I belong? The question of home, of home. And I mean, just my own story, when I go to South Georgia, you know, and I've been there about 48 hours, I realize this is nice, I like this, I like these people, and it's sort of comfortable here, but this is not my home. I'm different than I was 50 years ago. I don't know what to do with that. It's, it's a, C uh, is why am I here? This is the question of purpose. Adam and Eve had a purpose in the garden. And, a, and again, life can be really hard if you go through your whole life saying, What's, why am I here? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> and I think God leans over heaven and says, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. And then D who are my people? 
I love this question. And this is really the question of Adam and Eve and marriage. But rather than just talking about marriage, I'm going to talk about, this is the question of community. The question of family. But the Bible talks about the church as the family of God. So it's, um, I think we're on good ground. Of who are my people? I know for Katie and I, when we walk into a crowded room, sometimes our private language will say to each other, these are not our kind of people. <laughs> or, or sometimes, you know, it's like, these are our people. And uh, I sort of think that's why Alan Jackson spoke to me, because as sort of corny as he is with his cowboy hat and his twangy voice and guitar, it's like, that's my kind of people. Just humble, just real. He knows all the verses to all the old songs. And he, was do he said, I'm doing this concert because my mama told me to. And it was like, I'm not kidding. And she was sitting right there on the first row. Anyway, all right. Who am I? Where do I belong? Why am I here? Who are my people? It does not get more basic. And that's what the Garden of Eden is all about. So let's talk through these four questions. And I, I think I've set it up. So if I don't get all the details, you can work it out. Who am I? The question of identity. When Moses, who wrote Genesis, we talked about the author last week, stood before God at the burning bush, this was the first question he asked. If we had time, I would have you turn to Exodus 3, when Moses stands at the burning bush, and after 400 years, God finally shows up and speaks. And he says, I'm the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've seen the cries of my people. I've come down to deliver them. And when Moses gets a chance to speak, the first thing he says, who am I? That'll move you to tears right there. My mother's Egyptian. No, my birth mother's Hebrew. My adoptive mother is Egyptian. I married a Moabite. Who am I? He's the original poster child for the third culture kid. Moses. <laughs> Who am I? And when I tried to kill an Egyptian to prove my identity, it only made things worse. So I've just been out sitting with sheep for the last 40 years. Can you help me? But finally he's asking the right person. <laughs> Most people when they ask the question, Who am I? They're looking in a mirror. You'll get no help in a mirror. You look in the burning bush and ask the one that created you and that formed the double helix of your chromosomes, uh, who am I? I think God will say, I thought you'd never ask. I'd love to tell you who you are. Uh, do you know the riddle of the Sphinx? What creature, which creature, walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, three legs in the evening? Do you know this? This is very famous. Uh, you, you're reading the footnote. Uh, it, but when... I'll read the footnote with you. According to Greek mythology, a sphinx guarded the gate of the city of Thebes. To every traveler who taught entrance, he would ask that riddle. Those who gave the wrong answer were killed and eaten. Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Oedipus solved the riddle and thus freed the citizens of Thebes from the evil control of the sphinx. The answer to the riddle is man. Four legs, what walks on four legs in the morning? It's a baby crawling. What walks on two legs in the afternoon? It's an adult going through life. What walks on three legs in the evening? It's an old man with a cane. But I think the meaning of the myth is what is man? And if you can't answer the question, the Sphinx is going to gobble you up. <laughs> you are dead meat if you don't know who you are. Well, the Greeks knew the right question. I don't believe they knew the answer. But it illustrates the importance of what Moses is saying and what Genesis is answering. Who am I? Okay. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we read last week. We are, God said, let us make man in our image. We are created in the image of God. This makes us unique. There's nothing in the universe like a human being. Nothing. Uh, you may have this 98% of the same DNA structure 
as a chimpanzee. <laughs> I think that's right. But you're not a monkey. And a monkey is not 98% human. Uh, we are not gods. We are not machines. We are not animals. And I say that because if I understand the impact of teaching Darwinian evolution to our students is we're teaching them you're animals by intention. You're complex, you're highly evolved, but the only difference between you and a monkey is a few million years of evolutionary development. You're an animal. That has enormous implications. Um, I, I sometimes hesitantly say, if we teach our children that they're animals, why should we be surprised if they behave like animals? If they take a gun in a high school and shoot people? They may just be living out the implications of the philosophy they've been taught. The strong survive in the Darwinian system. The weak are killed off. There's the well, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big one. We are human persons. This explains our culture's historic belief in the sanctity of human life. And that's true whether they're handicapped, whether they're mentally present, whether they can become a tax-paying contributor to society or not. If they're a human person, they're worth fighting for. That is not a shared value everywhere in the world. You learn that from the Judeo-Christian ethic, I think, alone. Note that humans come in only two varieties. So God created man in His image. In the image of God, He created him male and female. He doesn't say rich and poor, He created them. It doesn't say black and white, He created them. It doesn't say educated and uneducated. It doesn't say Republican and Democrat, He created them. It said, human persons come in two varieties and only two, little boys and little girls. I never thought that would be controversial. <laughs> yeah. That is very inflammatory today. And I heard somebody, I think yesterday, was saying there was some doctor that would, uh, if, but would withhold hormones from a child until like they were 15, so the child could make a choice about the gender they wanted to be, or this type of, this is what's the discussions that are going on. Just as we do not choose whether we are born, nobody consulted me about birth, <laughs> do stand, do you want to be born, or who my parents are, or what my name is. So nobody consulted me about my gender. It was given to me. And I want to just say, praise the Lord. There's never been one day of my life I wished I was a girl. <laughs> I just, I don't know, maybe I've got too much testosterone. I don't know. Who asked a question? I'm somebody. Yes. Thank you. Wow. Really? <laughs> well, this is... And this, and I don't want to pretend that these issues are simple to address or are not painful. And they don't even have implications for in a room like this. This is real stuff. I do want to say there's a, a vast amount of ignorance on what the Scripture says. And I think we very humbly need to remind the world around us, Genesis says, 
human persons come in two varieties. That's, and it's not black and white. You know, it's not rich and poor. It's male and female. That's a, it's, you're, yes? You're familiar with a guy named uh, Eric Metaxas? Yes. He was talking with a person who was going to debate him about the uh, interchangeableness of male and female. He said, I'll talk with you about that when a rooster lays an egg. <laughs> Okay. Good. Christian and Medical Dental Association has some excellent materials on this. CMDA. Uh, but um, Genesis 2:7. Made from dust and animated by God's Spirit, humans are part earth and part heaven. Think about how we were made. We're made out of dirt, which comes from the earth. We're earthlings, like the animals are. There's things we do share with chimpanzees that are pretty interesting. You can learn a lot about humanity from chimpanzees. Not everything, but you, there's our similarity. But we've got the breath of God in us. The spirit, the breath. We are a sort of hybrid. A hybrid is something of mixed origin. So we have heaven and earth in us. And uh, the second word, I've never heard others do this, but I think it works, but an amphibian. You know what an amphibian is? Like a frog can live in water or land. Well, we inhabit two environments, earth and heaven, body and soul. Animals don't do that. And God... Well, in the incarnation he does that, but the angels don't do that. But we've got dirt, we're made of dirt and spirit. Just meditate on that. Just worship about that. That's an amazing thing. Are you trying to talk to me, Carol? Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm trying to formulate what Jesus is going to do Yes. Yes, in the womb of Mary, Mary's, and I don't, Mary's egg was fertilized by what? Not by Joseph. By a divine seed of, of a, 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 yeah. And Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus comes to bring a new creation. He's Adam. He's going to repair, he's going to do it right what Adam failed. There, there's a lot more to the story than this, but um, let me keep moving. Wow. Our, um, Genesis 2, verse 9, this is where God says, don't eat the fruit. This is the only prohibition given to man. And in fact, before he says, don't eat the fruit, he says, you can eat all the fruit of all the trees. But that tree there, don't eat. The tree gave Adam the knowledge of good and evil, which I believe is a good thing. I think it's part of the image of God. So we want to be able to know the difference between good and evil. That's good. But God, the tree gave Adam the knowledge of good and evil when he abstained from eating it. Are you following this? So in other words, if I stand there and look at the tree of good and evil and don't do anything, I'm discerning the difference between good and evil. I get it. Snake comes along next week. Says, nah, 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 you're thinking wrong. The way you discern good and evil is to eat. It's called the knowledge of good and evil. Go eat it, and then you'll discern good and evil, and you'll be like God. Whew! That's demonic. That sounds so enticing. It almost makes sense if you listen to the snake. It's a... Um, the serpent claimed moral discernment came when the fruit was eaten. Tragically, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, all moral discernment was lost. 
So in a sense, the snake was right. You will know the difference in good and evil, but not the way you think. Look at my footnote, and this is a good one. Number three, footnote three. This is a quote from Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis. I wish I had thought of this. You understand sleep when you're awake, not while you're sleeping. Good point. You can understand the nature of drunkenness when you're sober, but not when you're drunk. Now here's his point. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people don't know about either. Well said. Well said. Well said. So you're, I'm going to be crude here, you're prudish little homeschool girl, you know, who's never watched a bad movie, never said a bad word, never done anything. You know, the worst thing they've done is didn't eat their vegetables because they were having a bad day or something. And that dear child understands the difference between right and wrong much better than the most savvy worldling out there. And I've lived long enough to say, you know, that's true. I'm not just making, that is actually true. No. Exactly. In, when innocence is lost, it's gone. And not even salvation can restore innocence. Salvation can make you pure. It can make you holy. But it can't, it's like virginity. Once virginity is lost, you can't get that back. You can't be pure. Praise God. And I think that's the story of the Garden of Eden. And I think that's part of why Abraham was looking for a city. He's not looking for a garden. Because he knows, I can't be innocent again. I've done too much stupid stuff. But I can be pure. And God's preparing us a city. That, that's a very good story. That's very good news. Genesis is so good. Tell you what, we're, um, we're going to stop with this one. We're not going to finish this. It, we'll, we'll come back next week, and we'll uh, take a little more time on this, because this is just so good. Um, this tree, number six, is placed in the garden to give man the opportunity to choose. It isn't forbidden because it's evil. It's evil because it's forbidden. That may be Oswald Chambers. I'm not smart enough to think of that, but I forget where I got it. But that's a good quote. There's nothing wrong, really, with the fruit of that tree. What's wrong, yeah, it's, it isn't forbidden because the tree's evil. It's evil because God said, don't eat it. Man is a free moral agent who, unlike the animals, will be held accountable. If a lion kills an antelope, what's God going to do to the lion at the judgment? <laughs> I think nothing. I mean, that's, that's what lions do. It's not accountable. But if a man kills another man. We're not animals. We're held account. This is... Carol, you're dying over there. <laughs> let, let, let me keep going. Though in, here it is. Though innocent, Adam is not yet mature. Like a child, he's never yet had to make a moral, real moral choice. And that's why the tree is there. God wants our love, not mechanical obedience. If he had wanted mechanical of obedience, he could have created robots. Where we just obediently did the will of God because we were programmed. 
God is not interested. And that is not the image of God. The image of God is, God says, you know, Adam, if you want, you can tell me no. And I think Adam swallowed hard and said, really? <laughs> That's a heavy responsibility. Therefore, he had to create the possibility for choice. A dog may not have the freedom to be undoggy, but a human has the freedom to be inhuman. Think about the word inhuman. That's a, that's a very interesting word. And this is Victor Hamilton. I couldn't find anything better anywhere than how Victor Hamilton Hamil handled the tree of good and evil. What is forbidden to man in the forbidden fruit? Don't eat that fr fruit. What is forbidden to man is the power to decide for himself what is in his best interests and what is not. This is a decision God has not delegated to the earthling. That's a, good, that's a good quote. In other words, what they're doing at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they're saying, we will decide what is good and what's evil. And they've already committed evil when they've done that. Today, many have experienced identity theft. What a great word. Somebody stole my identity. Or maybe I just lost it. But, and th even among Christians, we forget who we are. That makes us confused, unhappy, and vulnerable. We are going to stop there. Um, what we're doing is trying to get in touch with why do we cry at certain points in life what, when we're aware of the longing. And I'm suggesting we do because we've lost paradise. And there's four things about paradise that we've lost. And one relates to our identity. Who am I? Who am I? And what uh, Genesis is telling us, I'm in the image of God. I'm not an animal. I'm not an angel. I'm either male or female. I'm made of dirt. That keeps me humble. But I have the breath of God in me. And that reminds me the dignity that's in you and in me. And I'm a moral being. God will hold me responsible for the choices I make. I'm not a victim. Next week we'll talk about where's my place, where's home, who are my people, and what's my purpose? Does that work? So bring this back. We'll, uh, that's the first time we've ever just got half through, but that, I'd, we'll go slow. This is good. Father, thank you for your word. Oh, my goodness, what a treasure it is. And would you speak to us tonight and help us, rather than looking in a mirror and asking the question, who am I, to look into your face and say, Father, Creator, Redeemer, can you help me understand who I am? That was the first question. Moses couldn't wait to ask it when he stood in your presence. And we pray you'd confirm to us that we're fearfully, wonderfully made. We've been redeemed with the blood of the Lamb. With infinite price you have loved us and made us your very own children. Let us sleep in the peace of that reality of who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray.